Thank you very much indeed, Deborah. That was great, very inspiring, very rich. Um, can I just pick up on one of the themes that you touched on at a number of points um, about activism? Can you just give us a description of the locations where that activism needs to grow and indeed what we, what anyone can do to help it grow, apart from, if you like, the indigenous dynamic that needs to produce it? Mm. You know, the thing is, I, th I think as with many things, so as with the policy universe where these policies have become quite remote, we need to personalize that idea of activism. So I would say activism starts in these pink seats here tonight. Because each one of us has a role in a city someplace. We are all urban residents, which means there's a sense of agency over how we control our households, how we get to work. There's certainly a sense of agency in how we as professionals interact with other professionals and empower other professionals. So my point is I don't want to localize agency and limit it to a specific community or specific locale. I think the nature of our story is so serious that unless each one of us in this room tonight self-identifies as an urban activist, we've got a real problem. Because if you peel away the high-level uh, aspirations of the new urban agenda, Ultimately, as I've said before, that's going to have to connect to a real person and a real place somewhere. And we're all real people in, in real places. And that, for me, is, is really important, is that this activism is not limited to someone else, so that we cannot defer the responsibility to an NGO or a government. We all personally have to take that on in a variety of ways. Thank you very much. Um, let me throw, throw things open at this point. Who'd like to kick off with any comments, questions to Deborah? Um, oh, wait, can you wait for the mic and can you introduce yourself, please? Thanks, Jill. Um, my name's Lisa Granger. I'm a citizen and no more. And all I want to know is some of the ways in which you have um, encouraged people in Durban to become activists and what sort of results you've had? Mm. Yeah, take that one, then we'll okay. go back to the audience. Okay. Yeah. I, I think it's important that, again, that we personalise that, that empowerment around activism because activism is only meaningful uh, if you can self-identify with the cause. And I think one of the big problems that we're having at city levels is that we're not hearing people enough about issues that are adequately important to them. And if you don't get that connection, you're simply not going to act. Um, currently, we're working through the development of Durban's first resilience strategy, which is quite an interesting process, because instead of doing the normal thing that local government does, which is produce a document in draft and then sort of send it out into the public and saying, you know, what do you think about this? We started off the conversation with saying, look, we actually have no idea what resilience means for Durban. So we need your help in talking us through that particular process. And it's been a three-year conversation. So you can't short circuit those sorts of conversations. You've got to make room for them. And what has been very interesting is out of that has not come the kind of traditional focal points for discussion. But people have really said, we feel that the challenges to resilience in our city lie in informal settlements in the way we plan and manage those particular areas of our city. They lie in the traditional forms of governance because as an African city, we have traditional forms of tenure and we have city hall forms of governance and they don't often fit comfortably together. And that process of sourcing what was actually of importance to urban residents, which is not the usual conversation we have in local government, has really brought to the fore a whole host of groups who previously couldn't identify with anything the city was doing. Bringing forward their experience and expertise, their offer of resources, their willingness to partner, to help work in these quite difficult spaces of, of informal settlement and beginning to look at the interaction between formal governance and traditional governance in our city and how that can work. So that for me at a macro level has been a real indicator of how just having a conversation that pinpoints what people's priorities are can draw people out in unexpected ways to contribute uh, to that particular process. Let's take groups of questions at this point, so. 
sorry. Um, Firu Zazakish, just um, someone interested in um, everything that's being said here today. Um, do you, Deborah, have an example of groups, of group of people or a project that is directly trying to achieve something in an area in Durban? If you could perhaps share that with sure. us. I mean, we take a couple more while we're in groups here. There's one here. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. It's Gareth Wall from the Commonwealth Local Government Forum. Um, I'm just wondering what, what can be done more to help raise the voice of local government. Uh, obviously, it's great you're here, and your voice is being heard a little, at least in here. Um, but what more can be done either globally next week uh, uh, and, and otherwise, uh, and what good practice have, have you seen and what barriers are there still? Thanks. Take okay. those two. Yeah. Great. First, starting off with the project question. Um, top of mind is a piece of reforestation work that we're doing. Because if you look at African cities, certainly we're never going to be able to access the resources um, that Global North cities have to put in place very hard infrastructure. And so very often our pathway to resilience is going to be using our natural ecosystems in a smarter, more effective way. But of course, we've got to do that in a way that creates a new economy and new opportunities for the high levels of, of poverty and, and underdevelopment that we have. So we have a number of pilot projects around the city where essentially we're reforesting key catchment areas, and that process is being done in partnership with a local NGO, where we're lo working with local communities, um, really focusing on the poor and unemployed, largely women and youth, who um, are the most vulnerable in those areas. And they have the opportunity to produce the trees for the reforestation program. Um, they're capable of then trading those trees through tree stores to access things like clothing, building materials, and so on. And we've got some great examples where literally one woman has built a six-bedroom house out of her tree credits. She's now sending her young female children to better schools on the basis of this particular work. So we begin to see in that kind of cycle, the beginning of potentially a new sort of economy, which is more respectful of the fact that we have a city which is growing up in the middle of one of the 35 global biodiversity hotspots in the world, a city that is plagued by poverty and, and underdevelopment, and a new way of managing both of those problems, which also increases our adaptive capacity, restores our catchments, our ability to manage water, and, and so on. But again, you know, those kinds of things come out of left field. We need to find ways of scaling those up and, and mainstreaming them, which again requires new conversations. So what can be done to raise the profile of, of local governments? I think already local governments themselves um, have realized that they need to self-mobilize. And we saw that particularly in the build-up to, to Paris with the formation um, of new city networks and the coming together of old city networks to bring joint power together. So that's already exciting because cities themselves are mobilizing. And if you look at the, the buzz currently, all of those networks are talking about the post-Keto uh, you know, period and what we're going to do to implement. The problem is all of that bottom-up mobilization means nothing if it doesn't connect into that international and global debate. And really where we have the gap is between those two. So it's not about top down or bottom up, it's this pincer approach. We need to bring those two elements together. And that for me is the important missing piece of our puzzle, is how post keto we begin to create arenas where national governments and local governments can begin to sit down as equals and begin to talk very practically about what implementing the Paris agreements, the city SDG, the new urban agenda actually mean. And those fora, are not numerous enough, they are not accessible enough uh, because of regional politics and so on. So that for me is the missing part because certainly as local governments we'll keep waving the flag, we'll be activist as, as we tend to be, but while the national and local are disjunct, we are still going to have problems. So that for me is, is the missing piece. Great. Um, we'll take another question there and then I'll abuse Chair's position to come back in as well. But please go ahead. Can we have a mic down the front, please? Uh, 
Hi, my name is uh, Murtaza, um, master's student at King's. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask whether private foundations are now best placed actors in achieving success where, when it comes to disaster preparedness now, or, or is it the state? Because when it comes to understanding the political dynamics or the terms that each government has, it's not really going towards more of a preparedness notion. So are private foundations more best placed? Or would you say a mixture of both? I don't know. Yeah. You see, I think it's, it's really, there, there is no silver bullet anymore. And so one can't point to a single actor and say you're best placed because many of these challenges are so context specific. Um, I think we've got to look at the local need and look at what that need might be, what the risks and vulnerabilities are, and then look at the players who are willing and able to enter into that space. So it's a very complex calculus at the local level where we've got to pull in a variety of actors who will have different roles at different time scales. And it's working out that complex calculus, which I think is, is the big challenge. So I wouldn't say that anyone is particularly well placed until you assess what the, the particular challenge is at the local level and then look at what resources you have that you can bring to the party. Thanks. Deborah, you spoke eloquently about needing cities where no one, no space, no natural system is left behind. Um, you live and work in, I think, in Gini coefficient terms, the most unequal society in the world, which must create hugely powerful kind of exclusionary and divisive dynamics in cities, gated communities, fear, um, division. What at your level, what at the level of the local, the local administration, what actions do you take to counter that, to counter that dynamic? Mm. Well, I think we've probably got one of the greatest macro challenges of you know, I suppose any urban environment in the world because the cities that we live in were meant to be the ideal apartheid cities where people were excluded from access to various areas. And so we're literally having to change the geography of, of cities. So if you look back to South Africa's history, the previous township areas only had one road in. So if there was a problem, you could bring in armored vehicles, you could shut down access and egress from those areas. So. We ourselves are going through massive infrastructure building programs to try and change the geography um, of the city. So that's one macro level intervention. But perhaps more nuanced and overlooked are the necessary changes in governance. Um, and I alluded to the fact that we live in a very interesting city in the sense that the central part of the city is something you would all be familiar with. It looks a bit like London or you know Brisbane. But if you go into the outer reaches of the city, those are largely rural and they are governed by traditional leadership. And that clash between city hall governance and traditional leadership has really stopped our society coming together in a way that has allowed us to move forward with big visions for, for the city. And so what we're doing now is creating the process, and one of those is the resilient strategy process I spoke about, which is welcoming in these alternative voices into a new urban debate where we acknowledge that no one has the answer. And that, I think, is an important thing to realize about local government. When I first started interacting with local government, the way our city was planned is they looked at what they did the last two or three years and they just projected that forward. We now live in a scenario where history is no longer a good predictor of the future. And so what we have to do is welcome in many voices <laughs> to help us reimagine what the city might look like and to give those people a real voice at the table. And that's meaning, or means for us, that we have to change the pattern of governance and use opportunities to have new conversations about how you manage cities under these unpredictable and uncertain times. Thank you, let's throw it open again. We've got uh, a number of questions down here. So let's take three and we'll go back. Uh, Emma Cox, PwC. Thank you for a fascinating insight. I think um, having recently read the New Urban Agenda, I can understand some of your um, sentiments that you raised about it. You've talked about different voices. You've talked about local national government bringing different people into progressing the urban challenge. It took me until paragraph 133 of the New Urban Agenda to see the word business um, actually mentioned. Would you like to talk a little bit about 
what you see the role of business can be in helping progress the new urban agenda and how maybe in Durban you're thinking about that. Thanks, Sam, and then, Sam, and then the... Yeah, Sam Bickerstaff, CDK, and um, thanks very much, Deborah. Not wanting to lose sight of your bricks and your cement, I'll just refer to the policy agreements in, in the Paris agreement, which depends, success of Par to Paris depends upon the ratcheting up mechanism to achieve living within just a safety, uh, safety of two degrees of global warming. Um, are cities to sort of save the, that can drive the agenda, that can lead uh, nation states who remain the parties in, 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 in that agreement to, to achieve that ratcheting up? There are a lot of zero carbon emissions uh, commitments emerging, but can that turn into reality to bridging the emissions gap that we still see? Thanks, Sam. And then, yeah. Hello, Divindi Grant from Mark McDonald. Um, so picking up on something you've said, how do you, how do you see the best way to sort of switch or get local governments to enter the conversation about ecosystem services? Is it valuation, improving technical understanding, or something else? Thanks very much, Do you want to take those three, Deborah? Sure. So starting off with the, the role of business, and I suppose that echoes one of my previous responses, is everyone actually has to be at the table. And we know that it's notoriously difficult in some particular arenas to begin to draw business into some of these, these discussions. Certainly looking at the work that we're doing in Durban, again, harking back to, to our work in the resilience space, there's been a very determined effort to begin to draw business into this debate to show the relevance um, of this debate to business in terms of being able to foresight where the future of the city might be and where the opportunities might lie in this changing space. And I think if we begin to have that conversation, um, you know, I think there's always a, a tendency to stereotypically label business as the bad guy. Um, when in fact they can be quite an active player if we make sure that the goals we're chasing are in fact um, common and geared around a particular purpose. So the reforestation program that I spoke about has business inherent as a key component in that as a way obviously to achieve their, their corporate uh, social responsibility outcomes. So again, giving people a real purpose, but. People want to see practical interventions, and that's the problem. I think the, the issue with many of these um, ideas, and it's the problem with the new urban agenda, we've left it at such a high level that people can't relate um, to them. We've got to pull it down so that people can relate to the reality, they can see the difference. And I think that's really a task, is to make explicit not only the role, but the net benefit. And then you know, we found that business becomes a much more engaged uh, conversationalist in, in that particular arena. <coughs> Are cities the saviors? Are they going to save us from, from ourselves? Well, it depends, I think. Um, certainly there's a sense that one of the big global opportunities to bend the curve lies in the city arena. And we've just had the scoping report for the 1.5 report that the IPCC has been invited to do by the UNFCCC. And during the course of that week in conversations, we constantly came back to the role of cities. But the real challenge there is we know a lot about what's happening in cities. You know, we see cities profiling the action, but the question is what does it add up to? So some of the fundamental science is missing, and this talks to some of the new important partnerships that I think need to emerge between science, both the natural and social sciences, and um, local governments, so that our activities can go out, be analyzed, and come back and be synthesized and help us contribute to that debate. And certainly groups like C40 are already beginning to push those boundaries in order to be able to, to demonstrate that. So potentially, but at this point, we don't really know. And hopefully, we can use the platform of the 1.5 degree report to really give us insight um, into that particular arena. And then the person in the middle who asked a question after my own heart, how do we get local governments to acknowledge the role of biodiversity and, and ecosystem services? Well, again, that links to really looking at the development agenda of, of the city. One has to remember that cities are developmental spaces. 
That's why we created them in the first place. You know, we settled along a river or a coastline because there was food, there was an opportunity to barter with your neighbor. The inherent heart of what cities do is developmental in nature. And so it's very important that we find the opportunity to lock in some of these alternative discussions around the many roles that cities now have to play in the 21st century into that developmental role. But that requires us to reimagine the developmental role of the city. So cities are no longer about just building houses and industries that produce widgets. They're about global custodians that could bend the curve on the climate change challenge, that become custodians of protecting globally significant biodiversity that are on the edge of the green economy, if you believe in, in such things. And so I think we've got to rearticulate um, the role of biodiversity and ecosystem services in that sense, is what developmental role does it play? We've certainly gone the route of um, valuating those ecosystem services. We're doing some new work with the World Bank on that regard. But it's really been tying those ecosystem services into the risk reduction role, the developmental opportunity associated with having functional ecosystems to guarantee water of appropriate quantity and quality that strikes the right kind of, of political note. So, you know, as urbanists and as scientists, we have to become a lot more politically savvy and begin to have conversations that can link into the predominant development narrative. Fascinating, thanks. Um, take some people at the back. Is there anyone at the back with questions? So we've got one here, and then we'll maybe go to the left at this point and then come back down. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I'm James Alexander from C40 Cities, um, and uh, we're very proud that you're one of our really active members, so thank you. Um, I wanted to build a bit on your last answer and ask about the, the commonly um, there's, there's a view that you can have either protecting the environment or development, but not both. And I want to understand from you what, what you're doing in Durban to try and achieve both. What have you done that, 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 can, that can try and deliver development and environmental benefits at the same time and make the city more sustainable and resilient whilst also growing the economy and creating more opportunities? Thank you very much. And we had a question, I think, around here. Yep. Hi there. Fascinating talk. Uh, sorry, Anders Lewinson, environmental writer. Um, I just want to touch a bit on the sense you said before. There's a, there's a sense that globe, the cities have a some global opportunity to bend the curve. Um, and also, could you talk a little bit about the, the, the huge impacts it have on resources as well, and how we actually live in the 21st century, and what impact stuff like smart grid and um, new energy technologies, um, um, what do you call it, um, decentralized energy and stuff like that, what kind of impact that can have cities. Thank you. Okay, um, someone want to come in with the last question? Yeah, thanks, Susanna. Hi, I'm Susanna Fisher from IAED. Um, I wanted to ask a question about timeframes, thinking with a kind of climate lens, I wondered what opportunities you've had in Durban to reflect, you know, longer time frame, the kind of traditional urban planning cycle of, you know, two to five years or your planning cycle, if you've been able to think a little bit more about the medium to long term challenges and really how you've managed to do that. Because I think from many, my kind of experience with other, other cities or hearing about national governments is a real challenge in, in being able to think before the short term to ensure that you're not locking in or, or creating governance problems for the future. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. Okay, so the question on the link between development and environmental benefits. Um, I think there are a number of answers to, to that particular question that could be, be technical, but to me, perhaps one of the, the greatest achievements is anyone who knows of me knows that I'm a deep green activist when it comes to the city. Um, and really what has happened during the, the course of our post-democratic uh, local government evolution is that we've begun to expand the environmental debate in a way that I alluded to that links into development priorities. So investigating opportunities to create new forms of economy that 
take communities that are excluded and largely illiterate and draw them into the pool that increase um, the opportunities for skills upliftment and business development um, on, on the back of environmental management opportunities. And I spoke to, to the reforestation issue. But then it's also been a, a process of entering into the political narrative, which I think has, has been important as well bringing forward those very practical examples to demonstrate the value um, of these, these alternative uh, views. And that's begun a process of changing the institution itself. So I'm a case in point. For 22 years, I've headed a department that's dealt with biodiversity and climate change issues. I've just moved into a new position in the city, which is looking at sustainability and resilience. So effectively, what we're seeing is institutional change, which I think is probably one of the most powerful changes at local government, acknowledging that these two things are no longer separate. So now I work in the team of the chief strategy officer, who's responsible for the long-term development plan of the city, inputting these new ideas. And that, to me, is the exciting evolution. We've moved beyond the demonstration project of you know, the solar panel or the tree in the forest to a real change in the way that local government is structured. And that change then offers the opportunity to produce new plans, new policies, which will hopefully give us the ability to kind of upscale. And that, for me, is important. But it's taken 22 years for that maturation of the debate to actually bring those two things together from an institutional point of view. The question around cities bending the curve and, and new technologies. To be honest, I get really frightened when people give me questions that have technology in it because I'm increasingly seeing, particularly in the climate change debate, that given the urgency that we're facing, we seem to be defaulting to technology as the response. There's got to be a smart grid. There's got to be some kind of panel. There's got to be some kind of switch which ultimately we just haven't invented yet. And once we do that, we'll solve it. The fact is, given the problems with intellectual property rights and so on, for many of the cities around the world, technology is simply not the answer. Um, so bear in mind, and I think Andrew alluded to some of the fairly challenging statistics, we're anticipating, what, another 2.9 billion, billion people to live in cities by 2050. The majority of those are going to be living in cities in Asia and Africa that look nothing like London. They're going to be small, they're going to be informal, they're going to be off the grid. And so to me, the really exciting response is the ability to bend the curve is to make those cities different. And I suspect while technology may play a role, it's going to be much more about rebuilding social cohesion, getting people to work together, to use more sustainable approaches through the use of natural ecosystems, localizing food production, predicting catchments. Um, and so I just I put a caution on that because I do sense the kind of excitement in the room generally where technology is mentioned. Um, and, and I think there may be a problem for that for the new cities of the century, which are simply not going to be in the front line when technology is there. It's going to play an important role. We've seen that through mobile technology in Africa. We've been able to leapfrog the landline, but it is not always going to be the answer. So just a, a, a cautionary on that. Time frames, very important, obviously. Um, as, as a biologist, I was trained to think by John in terms of 100 and 1,000 years, which is very difficult when you're talking to a politician who's thinking in a four to five year timeline. Um, but there has been a push, and Durban was one of the few cities around the world who began to think about 100 year plans. So beginning to think about that longer term and what that might mean. And I think that's very important. We haven't got it entirely right. But what it does do is it allows us the opportunity to think about the trade-offs that may be um, lying in wait for us along our development path. Because another thing that frustrates me, and I have not forgiven the first Earth Summit in 1992 for, is this idea that we can have these win-win-win scenarios. I think the reality is around the world that we're facing win-lose scenarios. And often we've got to debate who's going to lose, what are they going to lose, and how do we deal with that loss. And so insights into those trade-offs, I think, are particularly important. And it requires a brave city 
to think about those longer term uh, processes. But again, that energy to focus on the longer term has come through the process of a city network. One city going ahead, being a champion in that regard, other cities becoming brave on the back of that experience and picking up that particular challenge and, and moving it forward. And so again, it comes back to what is the role of cities and city networks in a post-keto phase? We've got to stick together because there are gonna be some there who have more access and resources. They can afford to be the champions, but braver, leading. That gives the kind of political capital for others to begin to say, we think we need to ask those longer term questions. So it's an incremental process of building out on good and often um, sort of individual action from champion cities. Do you have any personal reflection stories? You were describing this as a storytelling exercise. Um, do you have any personal stories that you can share on that, on that sense of shared experience and how these networks build action? Yeah. I suppose most uh, recently has been, I work with the, the Durban Adaptation Charter. There was a very real frustration we were experiencing in Durban because we were talking about adaptation action. Everyone else was talking about mitigation. Um, and so the Durban, action, the Durban Adaptation Charter became a real platform to begin raising the flag around the importance of, of adaptation. And we began to realize that we would ourselves have to be the agent of change, the champion city. So through the charter, what we've done is, and we're a very big kind of primate city in a typical African sense in the province, we've reached out and formed a compact with our surrounding municipalities that are less resourced, have access to less skills than we might have. In order to create a partnership to share our experience and learn from theirs in terms of, of climate change adaptation. We're also reaching out to Mozambique and local authorities in that particular area to again begin sharing experiences and learnings across that. And that's all been done without national government support. On the back of that success, we've gone to national government and said, we think this model of a compact, which we ultimately learned from Fort Lauderdale in Florida, um, is useful at a national level. And so national government is now looking to the creation of similar compacts around all of the major metropolitan areas in South Africa to create these kind of partnerships to advance this kind of action. Great, thanks Deborah. We've got another 10 minutes if we wanna use it. So who has a burning question or a story to share? The, I'm being pointed up the back here, so we'll go there first. And then. Thank you very much. My name is Yazan and I come from Nairobi. So I'm really interested in uh, what Durban has been doing. But my question is, how do we expand this knowledge, practice, and initiative to other African cities who obviously have very low capacity in terms of finance and institutions? We had a... Thanks. Um, Zoe Springings, also from C40 Cities. Um, I wanted to ask you, Deborah, as you've watched for decades about maybe how cities have changed in the narrative, but how optimistic or pessimistic are you that, that now this name-checking of cities and UN documents and international agreements will mean that nation-states really want to hand over money and, and power to cities, particularly maybe in a South African context in, in the wake of the, the local elections, but also globally as well? And our last question here for this round. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just very inspired by the this idea of the. Of Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Um, I'm an architect. My name is Kenny Ash, and I run Little Practice here in London. Um, I'm very inspired by the idea that um, you discover um, new voices, and um, although the, the technology you feel can be a distraction, I just wondered how much the visual um, has played over the last five or 10 years in your thinking um, on uh, the connectivity that you're talking about, you know, um, building up the physical infrastructure, but also the, um, you know, the resilience that um, through, the, through the social networks that, that you need to change um, the feeling of power and agency that local people would have. Do you want to take those, Deborah? Sure. And then if anyone has any Last questions. I'll take one more round after this. Right. Um, to my comrade from Nairobi, greetings. Um, 
yes, that, that's a huge challenge. You know, how, how do we get to work together across the African continent? Um, I think there are a number of opportunities. I've already cited the 100 Resilient Cities work that's been done. So we have a number of cities in Africa where the model of that particular program is creating an opportunity for those cities to begin to share their stories and their differences. But it does require that we have those platforms to meet. You will know, like I know, how difficult it is to communicate on our continent. You know, very often you can't hear people on the phone line, the Skype links don't work. And so what it does require is structure and resourcing to make available those opportunities for us to talk. And what we've done is we've used uh, parallel opportunities. So we ran, for example, a climate change conference in Durban, and we used that as an opportunity to get the African 100 resilient cities uh, together as a sidebar to, to have a conversation about what was important to us. Um, because the African urban agenda is very different to, to everywhere else. But again, it comes back to the fact that that has got to be enabled, both by ourselves, using our opportunities and our own resources, um, but also by outside interventions, making those opportunities available through programs and, and so on, um, in order that we can share our stories and, and learn from those. So it does require direct agency in, in that regard. How optimistic or cynical am I that nation states are going to see the light um, and, and recognize that power and money should flow to, to local governments? I think we've got to be realistic, particularly where we are in terms of the global development cycle, that that's not going to be an immediate response from, from the nation states. I think they're, they're worrying about other things. And, I think many nation states are troubled by the rise of powerful city states and powerful mayors. Um, you know, they're seen as potential threats in, in some parts of the world. Um, so I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think through the consistent mobilization of local governments by actively reaching out, by knocking against the glass ceiling that's created by, by national policy, that that's the only way of beginning to bridge that, that particular gap. There again, of course, there are nations who are very innovative um, and who are leading on this. And so they set that kind of example that, that others can follow. But again, there's no silver bullet. You know, there's no easy ask here. It's not like we can produce a recipe and say, if we do this, suddenly there'll be this great conversion. It's going to take hard work. And that's why I really underscored the fact that there's a great deal of unfinished activism out there because all of these important things still need to go those final two, three, four steps of, of the journey, the, the, step, uh, the need for that activism is, is not yet complete. So I'm neither cynical nor optimistic, but just know there's a great deal of, of hard work that, that lies ahead to, to move us forward. Just in terms of the question around what role does the visual um, have in changing the, the power distribution and, and the agency, I think that goes back to a realization that, particularly having been trained as a scientist and believing in the power of science, I got very frustrated when you go to City Hall and suddenly, you know, no one wants to look at your graphs or your maps um, or anything like that. And in fact, what we've learned is only by a very practical demonstration of change that you capture the, the mind of leadership. So in many ways, the visual is playing a critical role so we, we virtually have a production line of experimentation where off the formal local government grid, we access you know, some outside resources, we experiment, we see what that produces in terms of outcomes that may be palatable or unpalatable. And then we draw that stuff into the mainstream as the visual representation of what change might look like. Because I think the big challenge for us is we keep talking about resilient cities, we talk about transformed cities, but no one's ever shown me a picture of what that might look like, particularly in Africa where, where I live and work. And so what we're doing by this process of urban experimentation is literally building out a jigsaw puzzle piece at a time and drawing that into the mainstream and then showing how all of these jigsaw puzzle pieces of urban experimentation begin to link together. And those eventually then create the critical mass that create the institutional change that allows you to drive that narrative into the more powerful parts of the city. So it's a very complex um, arena of political activity and experimentation and just sheer doggedness on, on some days. But that ability to show 
is probably one of the most important pieces of linking experimentation to institutional and policy change. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I want to come back just, you know, as we're closing to Kita. You've been um, entertainingly tough on the new urban agenda, which is indeed a kind of fairly um, striking liturgic document in many <laughs> ways. Um, but you've also spoken a, a couple of points about a post-keto, or you've talked about what can we do post-keto, which kind of suggests intriguingly that you've not given up on Habitat 3 as a moment of change or as a moment of possibly transformation. So can you just square that a little for me? Where do you see mm. the importance of keto and the potential? Okay. So I suppose going back to that analogy of bricks and cement, at this point I'm more interested in the cement that we can use to, to pull these bricks together. So we've got in the bag, we've got keto, or hopefully we'll have keto unless there's some kind of major revolution there next week. We'll have the new urban agenda, we'll have the SDGs and, and the Paris Agreement. But we need to find fora where we can bring the different partners together to talk about how these things begin to link in an effective way. Um, and certainly I think the beginning of that conversation of how you pull the SDG, you pull Paris, and you pull the new urban agenda, um, there's an opportunity through work that we hope will get approved at the next panel meeting of the IPCC to have a global conference on cities and climate change science, where in fact we can look at how these different jigsaw puzzle pieces can in fact fit together um, in the cities of the 21st century, because there's no denying, let's not hide from the fact that the climate agenda is the new development agenda. And I think Paris really clearly indicated that. And so let's use that momentum to convene people across the practitioner arena, um, across the scientific arena, across the local government arena, to begin to figure out how we build the glue that's going to link these policy pieces together. And what does that glue look like? That glue comes in the form of data about what is happening at the local government level. You know, as my colleague from Nairobi said, you know, how do we share these things? We're all doing exciting stuff, but half of us don't know about it. How do we collect that? How do we collect it in a way that creates a critical mass that we can begin to analyze it, that we can demonstrate that cities can, in fact, bend the curve? And by bending the curve, we can then make the clear, decisive argument that we can link back to the financing because the power to bend the curve is in fact in our hands, then we can access the right to the Green Climate Fund and the opportunities that lie there for, for particular financing. So I think for me, I haven't given up. What I am seeing in my mind's eye is I've got a basket of jigsaw pieces or bricks that I somehow need to stick together to make a functional wall or an attractive picture out of my jigsaw puzzle pieces. And we've got to create opportunities post keto to draw all of these stakeholders together to begin to find the opportunities to link these narratives together into a cohesive whole. The challenge is up to this point, we've been so busy chasing each one of these things. You know, so you do the SDG, you do Paris, you do keto, that we haven't really had that opportunity to draw those together. It's unfortunate that the new urban agenda didn't take that opportunity. I think there was a, a ripe moment there, but that hasn't happened. And so we're never defeated in the trenches. We go on fighting. So we create further opportunities post-Keto to, to have those conversations. An important one is coming up through, through the IPCC. Thanks very much, Deborah. I'm getting uh, signals at this point on, on time. So I think we need to draw to a close at this point. But many thanks for sharing the stories. I mean, there are many things that I think we can draw from this, um, the eloquence of your view on activism, the importance of sharing learning and sharing stories, the potential for cities to lead in the climate space in various ways, um, but also I think above all for me these inspirational examples of what um, good practice at the local level linking communities and local government can achieve, um, which is something that we often don't see from, from other worlds if you like, and that was, so that was really fantastic. Um, also, this sense of how we combat exclusion, which, you know, there is obviously the risk that this is going to continue to be a driving force in our world, um, and the role, indeed, that uh, city governments can play in that. So, many, many thanks. Um, at this point, I think 
I would like to start by thanking my IAD colleagues who have organised this. So if we could just have a round for them, that would be great. Too many to know, but many thanks indeed. Um, and then particularly to thank Deborah for um, being our storyteller for thank you. this colloquium. So many thanks. Thank you. And thanks to all of you as well. Uh. And now we can move for the... Um, Down back to the library. Down back to the library for... For the free for finger food. For, for networking and food. Thank you all very much. <laughs>